Hey everybody, welcome back. In this video series, we're working on building a Minecraft clone in JavaScript. And today I'm super excited because this is probably my favorite part of this project, and that is terraforming. So that's right, we're gonna work on being able to mine blocks, so we're gonna be able to add blocks and build structures and things like that. After today's video, it's gonna really start to feel like Minecraft. Let's do a quick recap of what we did in the last video. And that was implementing infinite terrain generation. As I walk around the world, we can see the, the terrain popping into view. So we worked on chunking. So taking our terrain, breaking it into chunks, and being able to load different chunks dynamically or unloading them from memory. So today we're going to work on, as I said, terraforming. So what's all entailed in that? So first of all, if I walk up to these blocks here, you can see this little selection indicator pop up. We're going to be working on ray casting. So being able to basically cast a ray from our camera into the scene and determine which block we're intersecting with. There's two different modes we'll be implementing. The add block mode. So I can go in here. I can lay down these blocks. If I press the zero key, we can go in and we can remove blocks. The first part will be showing you how to create the selection indicator, both in the add block mode and in the remove block mode. And I've, I've mapped all the blocks to the, the number keys on the keyboard here. We're going to work on the UI in a separate video, get that toolbar down so we can see what block is selected. But can lay down grass, dirt, stone, coal, copper. So finally, once we get adding and removing blocks working, we're going to work on persisting that data to memory. Because we've done terrain chunking, that means that, you know, let's say I were to go over here. Let's lay down some stone blocks and I start working on a little house. So I'll just lay down a little foundation here. Maybe I'll, I'll put some windows in it, make it look pretty. So I won't, I won't finish this, but you know, I've spent hours building the structure and then I'm going to go walk away. I'm going to go find some more resources. If I start walking in this direction, you know, because we've imp implemented terrain chunking at some point, my structure is just going to get unloaded from memory. So I need to be able to come back over here and have that structure reload. So that means any changes that the player is making to the terrain, we need to be able to persist those to some data store. Then when the player comes back to that chunk, that chunk is reloaded. We need to reload those changes and apply that to the chunk before we render it. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that we're going to be doing in this video, a lot of really useful things that you'll learn. So without further ado, let's get started. So to start with, we're going to work on our block selection. So we'll need to implement a ray caster so we can cast a ray into the scene and be able to pick a particular block the player is looking at. So we'll begin in our player class here. And let's go ahead and to find a new variable at the top here called raycaster. And this will be a three raycaster. So for the origin and direction, those are going to be set each frame so we don't need to initialize them to anything we'll set them to null and then for the the near distance and the far distance this is basically how far from uh, the camera is the ray going to start so we just want that to start right at the camera plane and we don't want to be able to cast a ray really far because the player really should only be able to pick blocks in their nearby vicinity so we'll set the far distance to three and then we also need to keep track of the selected coordinates of the block. So if we do select a block, we're going to keep track of the X, Y, Z coordinates of that and store it in this variable here. Now for each render frame, we're going to need to update this raycaster, basically dependent on where the player's camera is, where the player's looking. So on our player, let's add um, right here, let's add an update method. And then below that, Let's add an update raycaster method. And then within our update method, we'll call update raycaster. So we'll be adding some more stuff in this main update method later. Um, but for now, we're just going to have update raycaster in there. And we're going to be working on fleshing out the details of this function here. Now, in updating our raycaster, we need to cast the ray against the world. So all the objects that are in our world, all the blocks. So in our update method, we're going to pass in the world and we'll pass that into update raycaster as well. Now we need to make sure that we call this update method from our main class here or our main file. So let's see, right in here before we update physics, we'll do player 
update, and then we'll pass in the world. So that makes sure that for each animation frame, we're going to be updating our player's raycaster. So going back into our player file, let's work on implementing the initial bits for updating the raycaster so we can get the block that we're selecting. So we're going to start by initializing the raycaster to the current camera position. So we can easily do that by calling set from camera on our raycaster. And the, the first argument here is passing in the coordinates of the mouse. We're actually going to just pick the center of the screen. So wherever the center of the screen is, basically that's where the player is looking and that's going to be the selected block. So I'm going to define a constant up here called center screen. And this is just going to be an empty vector too. So I'm doing this so we don't have to redefine a new vector for each frame. It's slightly more efficient. Pass that into set from camera. And then we'll pass in the reference to our camera. So now that we've initialized our raycaster, we need to cast array against our world and determine which blocks are selected. So we'll start by initializing an array called intersections. And we'll call raycaster intersect object. And then we'll pass in our world here because we're intersecting against the world and all the blocks within it. And this second argument here is whether or not we want to recursively kind of search through the world. And we want that because the world is composed of chunks and those chunks are composed of blocks. So we'll set this to true. One important thing of note here is that this returns an array of intersections and the intersections are returned sorted by distance with the closest first. So when the ray hits one block, it's going to keep going and just uh, basically going until we reach our, our far distance that we set. And it's going to return all of the blocks that intersected. So we want the first one that the array intersects with. So we'll grab the first one. So let's check if intersections.length is greater than zero. So did we intersect with anything at all? So if we did, we'll grab that first intersection so just to check our work here, let's log to the console. Let's get our intersection. And there's a whole bunch of stuff here uh, contained within the intersection, but we want the object that we're intersecting with. And we'll get that object's position. We'll print that to the console. All right, so let's go to the browser and check our work here. Let's see if our raycaster is working and it's returning the position of the blocks. So first of all, I am getting a bunch of errors here. And I did a bit of debugging on this, and I lied. For the Raycaster, we don't want to pass in nulls here, even though it's a bit deceiving because the origin is an optional and the direction is optional. Let's set these to empty vector threes instead to fix that error. You can see that when I walk up to a block here, let's hide these controls. When I walk up to a block here, it's actually returning zero for the position. And there's an important reason why that's happening, and that's because our world is composed of instance meshes. So each of these blocks is not a mesh in itself. It's an instance within our instance mesh. There's a little bit different handling that we need to do for that. Let's go and adjust our code. So we're returning the position of the instance and not the position of the instance mesh. So before we get into those code changes, I thought it'd be helpful to add our selection helper in first. So that little yellow box that kind of highlights the currently selected block I think that'll help debugging this. So let's add that in first. And that can assist with the code that we're about to write. So let's go to the constructor for our player here. So I want to define a material for our little selection indicator. So this will be a new mesh basic material. So I want this to be transparent. We'll set the opacity to about 0.3. And we'll make it a really bright yellow. Then we need to define the geometry. So it's going to be a box. So do a three box geometry. This box is going to basically overlay the blocks in our world. So let's make it just slightly bigger than a block. So the blocks are one by one by one. So I'll just make this 0 0.1, 0 point, sorry, 0 0.01. So let's add a property to our player called selection helper. So we'll do this dot selection helper so we can access this in our update raycaster method. This will be a new three mesh. 
and we'll pass in our selection geometry, selection material. And then of course, we need to add this to the scene. So we'll do scene add this selection helper. So in our update raycaster method here, we'll set the currently selected chords to the position of the object we're intersecting with. So this is gonna change in a bit, but we'll just stick with this for now. And then our selection helper, we want to set the position of that to the currently selected coordinates. Now, if we don't intersect with anything, then we need to hide the selection helper. So we'll set selected chords to null, and our selection helper will set the visibility to false. So likewise, we need to make sure that we're setting the visibility of our selection helper to true here. So we know that this code isn't going to work right now because this object position is just returning 000. So I'm going to show you how to get this code to work for instance meshes. If we look at our intersection, so we can see that this returns an instance ID here. So the developers of 3GS have actually designed the Raycaster to work with instance meshes. If we're intersecting an instance mesh, it'll actually return the instance ID of the block that we selected. So we can use this to get the exact block that was selected. And there's a, a couple lines of code we need to do to get the position of that instance. So let's start by defining a variable called block matrix. This is gonna be a four by four matrix. And then for intersection, let's get the object. Then we're gonna call get matrix at. So get matrix at is a property or a function of the instance mesh class. So we need to pass in the instance ID. Okay. And then it'll actually write the transformation matrix of that instance to whatever value we pass in here. So we'll pass in block matrix. So if you don't know what a transformation matrix is, don't worry, you don't need to really know the math behind it. All you need to know is that transformation matrix contains the position and the scale and the rotation of an instance, so any block in our world. Now we're not rotating our blocks, we're not scaling them, so really this just contains the position of our block relative to the origin of that instance mesh. So I'll add a quick comment here, get transformation matrix of the intersected block. Now we want to extract the position out of this transformation matrix here. So this selected chords equals new three vector three. And what we can do is we can apply a matrix four, pass in our block matrix. So this will extract the position from the blocks transformation matrix and store it in selected chords. Let's also be sure to update our console log statement here. Let's print the selected chords. So going back to the browser, now when we point at a block, we can see that the position is being printed out to the console. And since we've added that handy selection helper, we can also see which block that we're pointing at. So there's one other issue that we have to worry about here before we get this uh, block picker working perfectly. So let's pay attention to what happens if I just walk in the negative x direction. And let's look at the console specifically. So you can see that I'm, my x coordinate is three and now we're down to zero. And now if I select this next block, you can see that it rolls back to 31. So the reasoning for this is that the position of our instance is relative to the origin of the chunk that it's in. So if I move over to the next chunk, the position of the block is always relative to the origin of that chunk. It's not taking into account the position of the entire chunk within the world. We also need to get the chunk's position that the block is contained within and add that to the position of the block to get the absolute position of the block within the world. So fortunately, there's not much more code we need to write to do that. What we can do is when you get the position of the chunk that the block is contained in. So the object that we're intersecting with is the instance mesh. And the parent of that 
is the world chunk. So the chunk is equal to intersection object parent. So this selected coordinates is going to be chunk position, and let's clone that. And then all we need to do is to apply the matrix to our selected coordinates. So the selected coordinates will point to the origin of the chunk, and then when we apply this matrix here, this transformation matrix for our block, it'll basically move selected coordinates from the origin of the chunk to the position of that block. I'm just going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to walk in the negative x direction. So I'm hitting x equals 0 here. So before, this would roll over. But now you can see x is now going negative, and our selection helper is no longer disappearing. So there's four different things that we need to do in order to get the block removal to work. So the first is capturing the mouse event, so when the user clicks the mouse button. Next is determining whether or not a block is currently selected. So if a block is currently selected and the remove tool is selected, then we need to go ahead and remove that block from the data model. So we'll get the XYZ coordinates of that particular block and we'll set that to empty in the data model. And then finally, we need to remove the instance from the scene. So that will remove that visual representation of that block. So let's get started by adding our mouse event handler. So I'm just going to add that in the main um, file here. If we were kind of building out this game a bit more, I'd probably add an input manager class to kind of break things up. But for now, this will suit us just fine. So I'm going to create a new function called on mouse down, which takes in the mouse down event. Then on our document, we'll add an event listener for mouse down. And then we will call on mouse down when that event is captured. So within on mouse down, first we need to check to see if we're in the first person mode. So we'll do if player dot controls dot believe it, it's called is locked. Let's just double check what that is. Sorry, I think it's down here. Yep, there we go. Player dot controls is locked. And then also check if the selected coordinates is not null. So if it's not null, that means there's a block currently selected. Now what do we do when this happens? We need to tell our world, hey, whatever block is at these selected coordinates, we need you to remove that. So let's open up our world file, and then let's add that remove block function. So I've added the remove block function at the bottom of our world class. So just setting up the basic uh, function signature here. We're going to pass in the x, y, z coordinates of the selected block. So first we'll need to get the coordinates of the block and the chunk that it's in. So we'll define a new variable called coordinates. And we'll do world to chunk coordinates. And we'll just pass in the x, y, z world position here. So coordinates, this contains the coordinates of the chunk as well as the coordinates of the block. So let's get the chunk. This get chunk. So we'll pass in chords chunk dot x and chords chunk dot z. So if there is a chunk at that location, then we need to basically tell this particular chunk to remove the block. So we'll do chunk remove block. Then we want to pass in the coordinates of the block relative to the chunk, which is these coordinates right here. So we'll do chords block dot x. Now, of course, we haven't implemented this remove block function on our world chunk. So we'll, then, we'll need to kind of mirror what we've done on the world here. So in our world chunk, I've added this function called remove block, which mirrors what we added to world. So we'll be calling this from our world remove block function. So first, we'll get the block at these coordinates. So this, get block, x, y, z. So if a block exists here and the block ID is not equal to blocks.empty. So obviously, we don't want to remove an empty block. There's no block there to remove in the first place. So this is where we do those last two things I mentioned. We're going to remove the particular block from the data model. So we're going to set the block of these x, y, z coordinates to the empty block type. And then we need to remove the instance from the corresponding instance mesh 
for that block type. So what we're actually going to do first is we're going to remove the instance and then we'll update the data model. Um, just the code just works a little bit better that way. So we'll create a new function called delete block instance. Once again, we'll pass in the XYZ coordinates. Now, before we jump into the code for deleting mesh instances, I thought we would take a beat and explain how that process is going to work. So if you can remember back to when we were creating our instance meshes, we had to give it a maximum number of instances in the constructor as a parameter. Let's say that maximum number was n in our case. And if we're thinking about a chunk, the maximum number of instances or blocks within a chunk is going to be the width of that chunk in blocks times the width once more times the height. So if my chunk is 8 by 8 by 8 blocks, then the total number of blocks or instances would be 8 times 8, which is 64, times 8, which is 256 total. So if we think of all those instances in terms of an array, so let's quickly, I'll draw an array on the screen here. So if we were to label the index of each instance in our instance mesh, so let's start with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 and then the last two would be n minus 2 and n minus 1. So in total, we have enough memory allocated that we can render up to n blocks on the screen at once for this particular chunk. Now, of course, we're not going to render that many blocks. A lot of our chunk is just empty space where the player is walking around. So we need to be able to control how many instances within this array are rendered, and that's done using the count property. So as an example, let's say I set mesh.count equal to 5. So this means I'm going to draw the first five instances in this array here. So that's going to be our 0 instance, the 1, the 2, the 3, and the 4. This is a total of five instances. And then anything after that is not going to be rendered. Keeping that in mind, this is the array that we're working with. How do we go about deleting a block? I can't just change the size of this array because it's pre-allocated to the maximum number of instances. So a technique that we're going to use is called swapping. So let's say I want to delete the instance at index number 2. And the last instance that's being rendered here is instance number 4, since this is what my count property is set to. Now what I can do is I can swap this 2 with this 4. So I'm going to swap this 2 with this 4 over here. And we'll draw this out here. So now the 2 is going to go where count is, which is at the end here. Then the 4 is going to go where that 2 was. Now to remove instance 2 here, all I need to do is I'm going to decrement our count variable on our mesh. Now this will no longer be 5, but instead it will now be, get my colors just right here, this is going to be 4. So count will no longer point to the 2, but instead will now point at 3. So if you remember that anything past count won't be rendered, we're no longer rendering this particular instance. So instance 2 has effectively been removed from our world, and that block will no longer be rendered. So that's basically how this process is going to work. We're going to identify the instance ID of the block that we want to remove, and then we're going to swap that with the instance in the count position. And we're going to decrement count by one. And that will effectively remove that block from the world. So let's start by getting the block at this location. This get block at X, Y, Z. So just as a sanity check, we'll make sure that the block instance ID is not equal to null. Or I should say, if it is null, then we want to return because there's no instance to, to delete. Now we need to get the instance mesh that we're moving the instance from. We have an instance mesh for each block type. So what we're going to do is we're going to search through the children. So when we're creating our instance meshes, which is in the generate meshes function here, we're sending the name of the mesh to the name of the block type. So I'm actually going to change this to the ID of the block, because that's the information that we have. 
So let's find the instance mesh where the name is equal to the ID of our block. So this is basically saying if our block ID is the grass type, then we'll find the instance mesh for the grass blocks. And then let's get the instance ID of our block. Just start that in a separate variable here. First, we're gonna perform that swap operation. So what I'm gonna do is get the transformation matrix of the instance in the, the last index of our instance mesh. So we'll do last matrix, and this is going to be a four by four matrix. And then on our mesh, we'll get the get matrix at, then we'll do a mesh dot count minus one to get that last instance. Then we're gonna store that transformation matrix in last matrix. Now, since we're also moving this instance from the mesh dot count minus one index to the instance ID index, we're gonna to need to update the instance ID of that block in our data model. So what we're gonna do is let's create a new vector. Let's call it V. And then V need to apply matrix four. So we'll apply our last matrix. So this will get the X, Y, and Z coordinates of that block. And then we'll set the block instance ID of the block at those coordinates to instance ID. So now we're gonna actually perform the swap. So I'm going to set the matrix at instance ID to the transformation matrix of that last block. So that's effectively moving the instance in that last location to its new home in instance ID. Now we don't need to set the transformation matrix in the last position um, since we're just kind of throwing that information away. And then finally, we'll decrement the mesh count. Now, last bit of cleanup we need to do, we need to notify the instance mesh that we updated its instances. So we do mesh instance matrix needs update equals true. And we'll need to tell the mesh to recompute its bounding sphere. This line here makes sure that the instances gets updated. And then this line here is updating the bounding sphere of our instance mesh to make sure that our ray casting will work with the new block configuration. So finally, we need to update our data model to tell it that there's no longer a block there. So we'll do this dot set block instance ID at X, Y, and Z to null. And we also need to set the block ID to blocks empty ID, since this block is now of the empty type. We should be good to go here. Last thing we need to do is to hook up our on mouse down events to our world. Do world remove block. And we're going to pass in the selected coordinates here. So to assist in debugging, I'm going to add some console log here. Say so removing block at player selected chords. Let's go to the browser and see if this works here. So it looks like the blocks aren't being removed. So I'm actually gonna remove the, uh, the code we had in our player. So we're printing out the selected coordinates. I don't need to see that anymore. So I'm clicking here. It looks like it's just printing out the object. Always forget we need to stringify. JSON stringify player selected coordinates. All right, so it's triggering our most down event, but it's still not removing that block. Let's step through the code step by step here. So world remove block, passing in the selected coordinates. Okay, that all looks right. So let's throw another log statement here. Let's say chunk remove block. Make sure this code is getting hit. And I'm actually going to print the, the coordinates that we're getting here, make sure we're passing in the right coordinates. And I can already see one issue here. Um, this should be chunk, not exclamation point chunk. So it's basically saying if the chunk doesn't exist, let's do this, but we want to make sure the chunk exists. So I think that may have been the issue, hopefully. So there we go. Now we can remove blocks.
So that looks like it's all working. It looks like the physics code is updating, um, but currently ignoring the elephant in the room here is that we can see into our world. If you can remember, we're only rendering the blocks that are visible to the player. So when we're removing a block, we basically need to go into all the adjacent blocks and check to see if they need to be visible now. Because, you know, if I'm removing this block here, then the block underneath should now be visible. We should see that block. So that's some additional code that we'll need to write to get that to work. So let's do that now. So in our world file, right below our remove block function, I have added a new function called reveal block. So this will basically just add an instance for the block at this location so we can see it. So I'm just going to copy pasta this code here. It's basically the same thing. We need to get the, the coordinates and the chunk associated with that block. So once we have that information, we want to add a new instance for the block at these XYZ coordinates. So we'll do chunk add block instance. So we haven't created this function yet, so we'll be doing that in a bit. And then we'll pass in the block coordinates here. So fortunately, adding an instance isn't quite as complicated as removing an instance. All we need to do is to increment our mesh count by one. Then we'll update that last location in our instance mesh array with the transformation matrix for our new block. Let's go into world chunk now. And right after delete block instance, I'm going to create our add block instance function. All right, so very simple. We're just passing in the XYZ coordinates. Now, the first part of this is basically the same as what we're doing up here. You know, we still need to get the block. We need to make sure the instance ID isn't null, and we need to get the mesh that we're adding the instance to. Let's just copy this code here. And we'll paste that down here. Some extra sanity checks here. We'll make sure that the block exists and that the block ID is not equal to empty. Because we don't want to add an empty block. And we also don't want to overwrite an existing block. So we need to make sure that the instance ID is null. So we'll get the mesh like before. And then our instance ID is now going to be the last index in our, or I guess the last active index in our instance mesh, which is going to be mesh.count. And we'll increment that right away. So let's go ahead right away and we'll set the block instance ID in our data model the block at these coordinates to its new instance ID. And now we need to go ahead and create the transformation matrix for this block. So like always, we'll need to create a new matrix and we'll set the position associated with that matrix to the XYZ coordinates of the block. And then we'll update our instance mesh. We'll set the matrix at instance ID to this matrix. And then since we're updating our instance mesh, we need to do instance matrix needs update equal to true. So I completely had a brain fart here. Um, this is what I get for copying and pasting code. This was totally not the right logic. So if the block exists and the block ID is not equal to empty, we already assume the instance ID doesn't exist because we're adding one. So if this is true, then we want to execute all of this code, not return. So sorry about that. I had a quick comment here. So now going back into our world class, we need to call our fancy method we added here. So right after we remove a block, we need to basically tell all of the adjacent neighbors, hey, if you should be revealed, reveal yourself. All right, so we've added those function calls in here. So cross our fingers. Let's go into the browser. Let's see if our code is working. And there we go. We no longer get any holes. So that is super cool. So one thing I always like to do when just start getting this working, see, so let's uh, change our terrain a bit here. And let's just burrow a tunnel right through here. So let's find a hill that's not too big. So I'm just going to click on through here. And as the door said, we're going to break on through to the other side at some point. 
So that tunnel was way longer than I thought it would be. Thanks to the power of editing, I've shortened it up a bit. But now we can burrow through our terrain here. I have a little tunnel that I've made. So it's now feeling very Minecrafty. So now that we're able to remove blocks, we should be able to add blocks now. So let's go ahead and get that final piece of functionality working. So let's go to our player class and I'm gonna add a new property on our player. Call it active block ID. We'll set this to, let's just say we'll default it to uh, grass. So like I said before, a lot of this, a lot of the uh, input should probably be moved to an input manager, but there's not a whole lot of input code. So I'm just keeping a lot of it kind of on the player or in the main file. We need to map the keyboard keys to change the currently active block type. So we need to update active block ID based on which key is pressed. So let's go down to on key down. Then we'll add a bit of code here to update that. So in on key down on our player, I've added the following code here. So basically when any of the numeric keys are pressed in the top row, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, we have five block types and zero is gonna map to the block removal. So the active block ID is going to be the, um, basically the number that we're pressing. So if I go look at blocks, you can see that grass has an ID of one, dirt two, stone three, coal four, iron five. So we're basically mapping those number keys to that block ID. Now in our main file, our mouse down event is gonna do one of two things. So if the active block ID is greater than zero, that means we're gonna be adding a block. If it's equal to zero, that means we're removing a block. So we'll add an additional if here. So if player active block ID is equal to blocks, so we need to import that blocks empty ID. And we'll go ahead and remove that block. Otherwise, we're going to be adding a block. So let's copy paste that code. So we'll add a block at these coordinates. We'll change this to add block. So now we need to implement our add block function. And when we're adding a block, we also need to know what type of block we're adding. So it's the very last argument here will pass in the act of block ID. Now let's go into our world class and let's add this add block function. So in our world file, I've added a new function here called add block. So we're passing in those X, Y, Z coordinates and the ID of the block that we want to create. So this is going to be really similar to what we did for remove block. And we've already done all the heavy lifting that we'll need to do. So this is going to be um, really quick to add. So it's the same deal as before. We need to get the coordinates of the block that we're going to add to the chunk and all that. So. I haven't learned my lesson here. I'm copying, pasting more code. So this will be chunk add block. And then we also need to pass in the block ID here. So just like before, we need to add a corresponding method in our chunk, our world chunk class to add a new block instance. All right, so and we're in world chunk right above remove block. We're going to do the add block and not add blocker. We're adding a block, sorry, dad joke. So first as a sanity check, let's get the block at these X, Y, Z coordinates. Let's get the ID and let's make sure that it is equal to empty because we don't want to accidentally overwrite a block. And then we're gonna set the block ID at these coordinates to block ID. And then we're going to add a block instance. So all I need to do is pass in the X, Y, Z coordinates there. And there, that's all we need to do. We've already added our function down here for creating a new instance. And so all we're doing is we're updating our data model saying, hey, the, uh, the block at these X, Y, Z coordinates, this is now of this type. So this is gonna be grass or dirt or whatever. And then we're gonna add that new instance to our instance mesh, and we've already implemented that. Now, if we just go in the game for a minute here, um, there's one issue in that I need to be able to select the block 
in front of this block. Like I don't want to add a block right here. I'm trying to add one kind of right on top of this block. So when we're adding a block to our scene, we need the selection indicator to basically um, move to the empty block that we're pointing to. So let's go and update that really quick. That is not too difficult to do. So let's go and find our update raycaster function. And right here, after we update the selected coordinates, we're going to say if the active block ID is greater than zero, or I should really say blocks.empty.id. I'm going to be a bit more, a bit more clear about what this is actually doing. So this dot selected coordinates, we're going to add. Basically, whichever face of the block that we're pointing at, we want to move a selection indicator in that direction. So that's easy to do. We just do intersection.normal. And the normal is going to be a unit vector, so a vector of length 1 that points in the direction of the, the face is normal. So it's easier to just visualize it. So if I'm pointing at um, the face of the block in front of me, you know, that face is pointing kind of towards the camera, so it's going to shift the selection indicator towards me. Now if I click on the zero key, that'll move back to block removal mode. And if I click on one or two or three, four or five, then it'll do block addition mode. So I should be able to add blocks. Everything should work. And there we go. I can add grass blocks. I can add dirt blocks. Let's add some stone. And I can go back and I can remove all these blocks. Similarly to how we were revealing the blocks that were previously hidden when we're removing blocks. So all the blocks that are now appearing, we need to make sure that instances are created for those. Now when we are adding blocks, we need to do the opposite operation. So any blocks that become hidden, we need to remove instances for those. That'll keep our game nice and performant. We don't want to be rendering instances that the player can't see. So in our world class here, we basically need to do the inverse of this. So I'm just going to copy and paste reveal block. because We just love copying and pasting code. So this is going to be hide block. So this hides the block at XYZ by removing the mesh instance. So we'll do chunk remove. See, I think I called it delete block instance. So I'll pass in the XYZ coordinates there. And then let's take this code. So when we're adding a block, we'll, you no, know, and basically instead of revealing blocks, we'll hide adjacent neighbors if they are now hidden. Now we only want to delete the instances for blocks that are completely obscured. And luckily in our world chunk, we've already written some code here, is block obscured. So we can just use this. So if chunk exists and chunk is block obscured, so we'll pass in the, the coordinates of our block here. All right, so I've moved our third-person camera here so I can look under the world so I can see all of the blocks underneath. So if I add some blocks on top here, I should expect to see these blocks underneath get hidden. So that's how we'll test this out. So I'm going to go back into first-person mode, and I'll just lay down a 3x3 three three pattern of grass blocks. And if I go back into third-person mode... Um, looks like our code isn't working perfectly here. It's still drawing some blocks that we don't need. So let's just go and double check our code, make sure everything's working. All right, so after a whole lot of banging my head on the keyboard here, um, I finally figured out the issue with this. And this is what I get for deviating from the, the source code that I'm going off of. So the issue is that in delete block instance, um, at the very bottom here, I am also setting the block ID to empty. 
Now, this is not correct because in some cases, we're just hiding the instance. We just don't want to render that instance anymore, but we still want that block to exist in the data model. And that's what we're doing when we're calling reveal block and hide block. We're just moving, we're moving or adding instances. We're not actually changing the block type at that particular location. So I thought I was being smart by just throwing this in here, but you actually want to pull this out and move this to remove block. So we only want to set the block ID to empty when we're actually removing that block from the world. Um, we don't want to always delete it, um, you know, in the case where we're just hiding that block. Just one last sanity check, make sure that this is working. So I'm going to lay down our three by three group of blocks here. And now we can see that all of those blocks underneath this group of three by three blocks that we laid down are now hidden like we expect them to. So I can go back in here, I can remove these blocks, and then go back into third person mode, and we can see that that space has now been filled in, those blocks underneath have been revealed. So that was the last bit of code that we needed to get removing and adding blocks to work properly. Um, now there's just one more issue that we need to figure out, and I'll illustrate it now. Now to illustrate my point here, I've set our world chunk size to something ridiculously small, just like eight by eight blocks. I'm going to lay down just a few blocks here. Now let's say that I built some kind of house or something here. And then I want to go off into a different part of the world and explore. So I'm just going to backpedal and wait until that disappears. So those chunks got unloaded from memory. Now when I come back, you can see that the house that I built is now gone. So all the modifications that I made to that particular chunk They've been erased, they weren't persisted anywhere. Um, so when I come back to that chunk, there's just nothing there. So we need to add a data store to keep track of all the changes that the player has made to the world. So I'm actually gonna create a new file here called datastore.js. And in here, I'm going to create a class that will store all of the changes that the user has made. Now our data store is just gonna be basically a class with some data in it. That data is gonna be an object. And this object is going to contain a bunch of entries. So each entry in this object is going to be a key value pair. So the key is going to be something that uniquely identifies the block that we've modified. And then the value is going to be the block type that it's been changed to. So we're going to add a couple functions onto this in a bit. Um, but let's start by going into our world. And right after our parameters here, I'm going to create a data store, and this is going to be a new data store. Let's import that in. Now, every time we create a new world, I want to clear the data store. And we don't want to persist any changes between new worlds being generated. So um, at the top of generate here, we'll do this data store clear. So since the terrain generation logic is inside of our world chunks, we're going to need to pass our data store into each of those chunks as well. So we'll just add another argument to our world chunk constructor, and then in our world chunk in the constructor, do data store, this data store equals data store. So now we can access any of those changes that the player has made to the world within the world chunks themselves. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to write to the data store. So anytime we modify a block, we need to store the information specific to that change in our data store. So what uniquely identifies a block? So we need to locate the chunk. So that's going to be the X and Z coordinates of that chunk. Then we need the X, Y, Z coordinates of that block within the chunk. And then finally, we're going to need to pass in the type of block. So what is that block changed to? So those are the six different variables that we're going to be recording. So let's create a new method on our data store, call it set, and we're gonna pass in the X and Z coordinates of the chunk, and then the X, Y, Z coordinates of our block, and then the block ID. So as I mentioned before, this data object here is basically going to be a dictionary of key value pairs. So the unique 
unique identifying information for our block is its position. So we need to get a key made of this information. So I'm just going to define a function here called get key. And this is not going to be a super optimal implementation. Super optimal. We're just going to keep it pretty easy. We're just going to return a string that is built up of all these different values. So in our set method, we'll get the key. So we'll just do get key. And then in our dictionary, we want to set the value of the data for this particular key to the block ID. And then we'll do a little console log statement here um, just to make sure that we're setting this correctly. Now we need to make sure we call this in the correct places. So let's go into world chunk and let's go down to when we're adding a block. So right after these two lines here, let's do data store set and we'll pass in the X and Z position of the chunk. So we're in the chunk itself. So we can just grab the position like that. We want the X, Y, Z coordinates of the block, which we're passing in here, and then the block ID that we're, that we're setting it to. So likewise, when we remove a block, we need to set that to empty. So down here, same deal. Instead of setting it to block ID, we'll set it to blocks empty.id. So now that we're writing to the data store, we need to be able to read from our data store. So when we're generating a particular chunk, we're going to read in any of the changes within the data store that may pertain to that chunk. So in addition to our set method, we'll need to also add a contains and a get method. So I've added the uh, functions for contains and get. So basically the same as set, except we're not passing in the block ID. We're just getting um, the block ID associated with a particular set of coordinates or whether or not a user change exists at that location. So like before, we're going to get the key. I'll just copy that code here. So we need to check if any changes are at this particular location. So all we have to do is return true if the data, so we're looking up the value associated with this key in our dictionary. If that is not undefined, then that means there's some change that was made to that block. And then when we're getting a change, likewise, we need to create a key again. And then the value is going to be, let's call it block ID is equal to this data key. So let's add a log statement here, retrieving value block ID at key there, and then we'll return the block ID. So that's all the functions we need in our data store. So in our world chunk, when we're actually creating our terrain, so we're doing that in this generate method here. So right before we generate all the mesh data, and after we've basically generated all the default terrain, we need to load in the player changes. So this load player changes, create a new function there. So let's go down to right before generate meshes and let's define that function here. All right, so I fleshed out the basics here. All we're doing is we're just iterating over every block in the chunk. And then we need to see, are there any changes at that particular block that need to be loaded in? So we'll say if data store contains so we'll pass in the X and Z position of the chunk and then the X, Y, Z position of the block. You know, this block has some changes to it. Then we need to get the block ID associated with that. So block ID, so basically we can take this here. Instead of doing contains, we'll do get. So we're calling this get function here on our data store. So we're getting the block ID associated with that particular block. And then all we need to do is call set block ID for this particular block to that block ID. And there we go. That's all we need to do to load in the player changes. So there's one other spot I missed here um, in our world class when we're doing generate chunk. Also need to pass in our data store there as well.
So this gets called when our player is moving around the world and chunks are getting um, loaded and unloaded. And this generate method up here is called when we're completely regenerating the world for the first time. So let's go into the browser now and make sure that our data store is working as expected. So I'll lay down a couple blocks here. Let's spell the word hi. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to back away from this. Wait till our chunk is unloaded. And now if I come back, you can see that my changes have persisted. All right, so that was the last bit of code that we needed to get terraforming working. So I've showed you how you can select blocks within our world, how we can remove blocks, how we can add blocks, and how we can persist those changes as chunks are being loaded or unloaded from the world. So thank you so much for watching. I know this is a pretty tough video, but I think uh, the result, you know, kind of speaks for itself. It was worth the effort. So the next video is going to be a fun one. We're working on improved world generation. So we're going to add some clouds. We're going to add some trees. We're going to add some water to make it look a little more Minecrafty and make it look a little more interesting. So if you want to get notified when that video comes out, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that bell icon so you can be notified when that tutorial video comes out. So thank you so much for watching and until next time, take care everyone.